Today, Today I'm, I'm uh, going, going to present, to present um, some, some results, results on the microbial methane, methane cycle in Guaymas Basin, the hydrothermal sediments of Guaymas Basin. Um, it's a unique um, model system to study microbially um, relevant processes, biogeochemical processes in the carbon cycle at high temperatures. The hydrothermally heated sediments of Guaymas Basin reach temperatures up to 150, 200 degrees, just 30 centimeters below the surface. So microbial life is crammed into this temperature gradient and you see uh, lots of unusual microorganisms which perform chemical reactions which are otherwise only known from cool locations at high temperatures. Of course, as you all know, Guaymas Basin is here in the middle of the Gulf of California, a section of two spreading centers, essentially running in a generally speaking north-south direction, the southern trench of Guaymas and the northern trench of Guaymas here at Baja California, here at Sonora. And the best studied location in Guaymas Basin is here, the center of the southern trench. This is where um, traditionally microbiology and geochemistry expeditions have been going and doing most of their sampling. This is an area with a high concentration of hydrothermal hotspots, hot sediments and chimneys where hot fluids from the subsurface emerge into the water column. Here we have the deep spreading center of Guaymas Basin overlain by a thick, several hundred meter thick layer of sediments. The sediments are a mixture of marine and uh, terrestrial sediments um, composed to a large degree of uh, phytoplankton uh, leftovers from the highly productive water column on top of Guaymas Basin and there's also a terrestrial component of the desert river runoff from the rivers of Baja California and Sonora. This sediment pile is now heated by hydrothermal fluids which are slowly percolating through it and creating temperature gradients of maybe 300 degrees deep down to 2 degrees Celsius right at the sediment surface where deep sea water is of course cold. The sediments are extremely rich in organic compounds. You have to imagine all this phytoplankton debris brings significant amounts of organic matter carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, essentially a microbial fertilizer mixture into Guaymas Basin. And this mixture is now being baked by hydrothermal fluids. Hydrothermal circulation works by drawing seawater in. This has to work along cracks and fissures in the sediment. And when seawater is hydrothermally heated up and chemically altered, it is returned to the surface, rising as lighter hot fluids and emerging at the surface of Guaymas Basin in hot sediment spots or in chimneys. There's a second type of hydrothermal circulation that is likely. The Guaymas Basin sediments have lots of basaltic sill intrusions, essentially pancakes of basalt which have inserted themselves during um, episodic um, eruptions into the sediment layers heated the sediment surrounding it into a kind of indurated brick-like material and are still often quite hot and there might be a shorter hydrothermal cycle not going all the way to the spreading center but making contact between seawater and the basaltic fill intrusions. After the hydrothermal fluid returns to the surface, of course it brings a rich menu of interesting energy-rich gases and ions to the surface. There's methane, there's sulfide, hydrogen, ammonia, dissolved organic carbon, uh, petroleum components, alkanes, uh, acetate and other low molecular weight organic acids, aromatic compounds. A rich microbial cocktail is percolating up from the Guaymas Basin sediments to the surface. And this is now fueling the microbial ecosystem of Guaymas. This is a simplified view that shows um, some of the processes that are important. Let's say here we have the sediment surface. So most of what you see is in the sediments. 
We have degraders of organic matter like sulfate respiring hyperthermophilic organisms which grow at temperatures up to 90 degrees Celsius. They oxidize hydrogen or acetate and other compounds with sulfate as the terminal electron acceptor and produce sulfide and CO2. Methanogens in Grimer's Basin. These are archaea specialized microorganisms which can turn CO2 and a limited range of other compounds into methane. This is biologically produced methane produced by the methanogens. And Grimer's Basin has the distinction of harboring the most temperature tolerant methanogens on the planet. Um, the species uh, Methanopyrus candleri that you see here was isolated from Grimer's Basin sediment and it is active at temperatures up to 110 degrees Celsius, above the boiling point of water. Water stays liquid due to the high pressure in the deep sea, so this is why these organisms can exist. The methane that is being produced in part biologically, in part also by um, hydrothermal degradation of buried organic matter, is now permeating the sediment, returning to the surface, and encounters an unusual microbial ecosystem, a collaborative consortium of different species of archaea and bacteria which together oxidize methane to carbonate using sulfate as the electron acceptor. Sulfate is used to sulfide. If you do the stoichiometry, it's an eight electron transfer and a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. These methane oxidizers ultimately produce CO2 and hydrogen sulfide, similar as the sulfate reducers produce CO2 and hydrogen sulfide. This now returns to the sediment surface where you have these unusual, very large microorganisms, filaments, thicker than a hair. Here you have 250 micrometers, so these are 100 micrometers. You can see them with the unaided eye. They are bacteria, but you don't need a microscope to see them. You can use a forceps or pincers to pick them out of the sediment. And these organisms, genus Begiatoa, are oxidizing sulfide to sulfate. They are often autotrophs, they assimilate CO2, and the electron acceptor for sulfide oxidation can be either oxygen or, in many cases, nitrate which is obtained from the deep water of Grimer space. Of course, for our talk, these anaerobic methane oxidizers are most important, and we will focus on these. The nitrate um, is the deep water nitrate of Grimer space, and it comes from um, remineralization of organic matter in the surface, so there's always a little bit of nitrogen flux from the sediments and also terrestrial input from agriculture often. So um, you, have, you have always around 20, 30, 50 micromolar of uh, nitrate in deep water. So let's look a bit more closely at um, sulfate-dependent methane oxidation. Here we have the stoichiometry. Sulfate plus methane makes sulfide and CO2. The interesting thing about this process is it's not catalyzed by an individual organism, it's catalyzed by a consortium. It's a consortium of bacteria that do sulfate reduction, you see it here, and there are archaea, a very different class of microorganisms, which are supposed to do the reverse of methanogenesis, turning methane to CO2, producing an intermediate like hydrogen or acetate, which is then taken over by the sulfate-reducing consortium member and oxidized completely to CO2. The combined action of both microorganisms generates the complete oxidation of methane to CO2 and the complete reduction of sulfate to sulfide. Another interesting thing is that in nature, of course, sulfate reduction and methanogenesis are often mutually exclusive. They compete for many substrates, like hydrogen or acetate. Both sulfate reducers and methanogens in nature often want to have it. And the sulfate reducers get more energy out of it. So they occupy any habitat space until sulfate finally runs out. Without sulfate, they cannot survive. And then the methanogens take over, produce methane. 
So in marine sediments, you often have this um, layer structure where first on top you have the sulfate reducing layer, below you have the methanogenic layer, which produces methane, and sulfate and methane coexist at the interface in the sulfate-methane transition layer. And this is where anaerobic methane oxidation, sulfate-dependent methane oxidation is supposed to happen. And in Guaymas Basin, there's a lot of hydrothermal circulation. So sulfate-rich seawater and methane-rich um, deep fluid are constantly mixed. So much of the sediment environment in Guaymas Basin is actually suitable for sulfate-dependent methane oxidation. These are the beasts. They are stained with different um, fluorescent stains. In green are the bacterial consortium members, those that are doing the sulfate reduction, and in red are the archaea, those that are doing the methane oxidation. And they are trading an intermediate. Its chemical nature is still unknown, but it has to contain the electrons that are removed from the methane and loaded onto sulfate. Um, the bars are five micrometers, so you see the normal bacterial sizes of maybe one to two micrometers, the thousandth part of a millimeter for every cell. Meanwhile, um, these um, anaerobic methane oxidizing communities have been quite well studied in a number of locations around the globe, but except for Guaymas Basin, Every single location is in cold hydrocarbon seeps, methane seeps, mud volcanoes, organic rich continental margin sediments. The entire process described in the textbooks is so far a specialty of cold environments. And the only exception is Weimar spaces. So here we have really a unique model site to study anaerobic methane oxidation at high temperatures. Okay. So we go back to um, two expeditions uh, that I was leading as a chief scientist back in 2008 and 2009 um, with the mothership Atlantis and the human-occupied vehicle Alvin, diving down every day 2,000 meters deep uh, to the southern Guaymas Trench and taking samples for microbial and geochemical analysis. And on these cruises, of course, anaerobic methane oxidation was a major objective. First, I show you some pictures. Here you see Alvin in its little garage on the ship. So there is a little railway leading to the back of the ship, and then Alvin goes in an A-frame into the ocean. And after the end of the day, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it returns. The pilots want to have dinner, and there is no bathroom in the sub, so one really has to come back. And then Alvin is lifted out, put back into the garage, and the Alvin crew, uh, essentially submarine electrical engineers who are highly trained, put the sub into working order again, and, for example, exchange the sampling basket for the next day's trip with the necessary instrumentation. And in the background, you see the mountains of Baja California. It's, so it's very deep, 2,000 meters, and it's close to shore. It's a unique location for spreading centers in this regard. Okay, here we have one of the pilots, Sean Kelly, looking through his little pilot window. And the two observers are sitting down on the floor at the side of the pilot, and they have little windows in an impossible position. So you really get back eight after a while. But the sub brings you down into the deep sea and back again. So one can see the deep sea floor with your own eyes, and of course the sub is equipped with cameras, uh, everything is videotaped, um, and um, the pilot is then operating robot arms, which take samples. It looks a bit funny, but it works really, really well. So when a pilot is well trained, they can do amazing feats with these robot arms. Some pictures from Guaymas Basin. Um, most of it is a sediment flat, and sometimes you have outcrops of hydrothermal minerals, uh, mostly sulfides and carbonates, which are often permeated by hydrothermal flow. So when you put a temperature probe on top of these rocks, they are hot. Uh, they are often covered by microbial mats. These are sulfur-oxidizing microorganisms. They see, they know there is sulfide coming out, which they are oxidizing. This is the Bejiatoa layer, which I mentioned in the microbial community slide. 
they overgrow a lot of Guaymas Basin. And whenever you see this orange or whitish color, you can bet here is hydrothermal flow. This is hot. Oh, and in the foreground, you see some of the sampling cores to cut out sediments. The robot arms are taking the sediment cores, like this, pull it out, and cut out a slice of sediment. Not this rock, it doesn't work here. So you need soft sediment. Okay, uh, some more of these hydrothermal outcrops, often very fresh uh, sulfides. Here you see actually schlieren patterns indicating hot water flow. So when the water curls and loops, and it's impossible to see straight through it, then this means hot water coming out of these crevices. So here we have hot hydrothermal flow. This, is, this place is called Busted Mushroom. It exploded. This corner here, you see, is obscured by shearing patterns. Hot water is streaming out here. So at some point in the past, this hydrothermal edifice of sulfide minerals must have exploded under a sudden outflow of sulfide, and the flow still has not stopped. And of course, there is life of all kinds in Guaymas Basin. This is the top of the food chain, benthic octopus species. So these fellows are maybe like this, with arms. They are very smart. They sit on a rock as if they want to tease the pilot. They seem to think, catch me, catch me, if you can. So <laughs> and uh, when the pilot, if the robot arm comes too close, they zoom, swim away very rapidly. So uh, for um, trophic studies, we had to catch some octopus. And that was really quite a challenge. With difficulty, we managed two, but I think many, many more escaped. And this is actually the basis of the um, trophic food chain in action. Here you have a hydrothermal outcrop with all kinds of microbial mats, so they take the um, hydrothermal energy sources directly. And here you have invertebrates, a tube form called Riftia parhyptila. They are very, very fast growing. Um, a full grown specimen can be one meter or one meter and a half long. They grow in clumps. And they are actually very distant relatives of the annelids, the earthworms. They used to be a separate phylum in zoology, but not any longer. Um, these are their gills. So they respire with oxygen, they transport oxygen, they also take up sulfide, they take up CO2, and they use it to feed special microbial symbionts inside their bodies. So they have a growing microbial colony in here, and they live on digesting some of these microbes from time to time. So they don't have a mouth, they don't have a gut, they have nothing except this microbial colony. And they feed their microbes by taking up the right gas mixture, oxygen, sulfide, and CO2 through their gills with specialized hemoglobins. So it's a really interesting and bizarre system for zoologists. However, life as a tube form is not funny because they are so dependent on sulfide flux. When their hydrothermal spring is drying out, so to speak, and the sulfide flux stops, when the tube form colony dies out, here we have a dead or dying tube form colonies and scavengers, um, crabs and isopods, take over and clean out the biomass. And the tube forms have to produce eggs and larvae at a very rapid pace to colonize new hydrothermal hotspots. And uh, Guaymas Basin is actually the northernmost habitat of their range. Um, they could, in theory, the larvae could swim around the tip of Baja California and then up California and to the next hydrothermal vent site offshore Oregon and Washington State. But the distance is too long. They have not managed that. So they occur all everywhere in the East Pacific and in Guaymas Basin, but not further north. And now at last, the sediments. We were interested in sediments. Here we have a nice hydrothermal hotspot marked by sulfur oxidizing bacteria with um, temperature lockers, long-term temperature lockers here and here, and another is here, to measure the temperature record. So in the middle of the mat, the temperature goes quickly to 90, 100 degrees at 30 centimeters depth. A little bit away, it's cooler. The temperature goes up to 60 or 70 degrees. And out here, it's still warm. The temperature goes up to maybe 20 or 30 degrees, but it's mild compared to the um, hydrothermal hotspot. And 
The sediments are loaded with methane. Whenever you take a sediment sample from these methane, um, you put it in the algae basket and bring it to the surface. The methane bubbles out. It's under overpressure. The concentration is so high, more than 1 to 1.5 millimolar, which would be the equivalent of atmospheric pressure, that the sediment just cannot hold it and it bubbles over like a soda bottle. Some case there seems to be kinetic inhibition, the core is not exploding, and then we sampled like crazy, try to get everything into high pressure vials to get the original concentration. So sometimes we could measure up to 15 millimolar methane, but that is still an underestimate. Other researchers have reported up to 50 millimolar. And this is maybe one of the most important instruments, the uh, temperature sensor. Um, it's a 40 centimeter long um, metal rod with temperature sensors here, 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 you don't see them it's inside, here, here, and here, 10 centimeters spaced apart. So you put it into the sediment and then bait a little. Because now the inserting the rod has caused a disturbance. Um, everything is cooled down a bit. Now it has to heat up again. And you can measure after five minutes the uh, temperature in the sediment. And of course, we were looking for hot spots, um, lo locations where the sediment temperature goes up to 100 degrees at the bottom, 40 centimeters depth, in order to have a nice temperature gradient that allows uh, for methane oxidizing organisms of different temperature adaptations. In a concept sketch, it looks like this. Imagine here is a surface with a microbial mat. This is what you see here everywhere. Microbial mats are everywhere. And underneath you have a lens. These are the temperature isotherms of hot hydrothermal fluid slowly moving up to the surface and bringing with it methane, organic acids and alkanes and hydrogen, CO2, ammonia, sulfide, oil components. And now these compounds are passing through layers of decreasing temperature and as soon as the temperature permits, microbial modification begins. Methane oxidizing archaea, snatch away the methane. Um, heterotrophs take the organic acids and alkanes. Um, chemosynthetic bacteria, which like these inorganic sources, take them. So at the surface, you have only a small proportion of the original flux. The microbes have taken as much as they could. Now, of course, having a nice temperature gradient with different methane oxidizers, we wanted to look for the upper limit of their temperature tolerance. Um, the story of carbon in Guaymas Basin can be condensed when you look for the most abundant carbon sources. Methane, at least 1 to 10 millimolar, and we know higher concentrations are possible. DIC, 2 to 50 millimolar, depending on where you are. Some hydrothermal hotspots have more than 50 millimolar. And high concentrations of acetate and other organic acids up into the millimolar range, like acetobalsamic group. Now, using this model system, we defined three different strategic objectives. How to identify the upper temperature limit of anaerobic methane oxidation, or anaerobic oxidation of methane AOM. First, we wanted to know, are there any geochemical or isotopic um, indicators for the temperature range of anaerobic methane oxidation? Second, is it possible to grow methane oxidizing cultures and enrichments in the laboratory and test their temperature sensitivity in the laboratory? And number three, um, if you look at the sediments and measure the in situ temperatures, is it possible to extract from hot sediments uh, signature genes which identify methane oxidizing microorganisms? So it's a molecular biological survey. So we had a geochemical, classical microbiological, and molecular biology approach. Okay, for the microbial biogeochemistry first. Methane, of course, is depleted in the carbon isotope 13 when it's microbially synthesized, so much that it easily stands out from other carbon compounds in nature. Um, in Guaymas Basin, it's a little less easy. Most hydrothermal methane in Guaymas Basin is around minus 43 per mil depleted in carbon 13 compared to the marine carbonate standard, but still lighter than the vast majority of carbon sources. 
So we can identify methane and all the carbon compounds that are made from methane by looking at its carbon isotopic signature. Also, when we follow methane oxidation, methane is turned into CO2. Then, because imagine you oxidize methane, you make CO2, which is isotopically light, much, much lighter than the common marine carbonates. So it's immediately identifiable that this is inorganic carbon that has been methane a short time around. It tries to masquerade as BIC, but it's clear that a short time ago it has been methane. Then a large portion of the methane pool is oxidized. Um, always the lightest methane is oxidized preferentially. So you more or less cut out the part of the methane that has the lightest carbon isotopic signature in this diagram around minus 80, minus 60, minus 80. And the remaining methane, of course, then gets heavier. It's more enriched in the heavy carbon isotope C13. So we end, end up with a heavier methane pool. So to see this shift in methane isotopic composition is to observe the imprint of microbial methane oxidation. We compiled all our methane concentration and isotopic measurements from uh, both cruises in 2008 and 2009. Here you see methane concentrations from sediments in millimolar plotted against in vitro temperature, measured by this long temperature probe. And you see that there's of a lot of methane in high concentrations, up to 10, 50 millimolar, certainly an underestimate, because much of the methane bubbles when we try to capture it at the surface. But there's high methane, even at very high hydrothermal concentrations, when it's clearly, obviously, of hydrothermal origin, because 170 degrees is just too hot for life. Okay, but what about its carbon isotopic signature, the stable delta C13 signature? Um, the average for Grimer's Basin subsurface methane that comes from deep subsurface sediments is around minus 43 per mil. And our data match this literature value quite well. Um, at the cold end of the temperature spectrum, we had a few samples where we had very light methane. Here, yeah, minus 70. And here we could say, okay, this is methane without a hydrothermal component. This is purely biologically synthesized in surface sediments. The rest, and then you can see a little bit of its biogenic signature in the moderate temperature range. And after that, the hydrothermal methane is just so abundant, it determines the baseline. However, we always see heavy methane depleted in C13, instead of uh, less depleted in C13, instead of minus 40 depletion, minus 20. This is the methane that is left over after light methane has been oxidized. So here we see the imprint of microbial methane oxidation, and it persists over a wide temperature range. Look here, 50 degrees, 100 degrees is gone, so follow the curve. It's a little tricky, but maybe 70 to 75 degrees. Seems to be the borderline when we can see the um, biological imprint of anaerobic methane oxidation in the uh, stable uh, carbon isotopic record. Then we wanted to check the same thing for DIC. Because dissolved inorganic carbon is highly abundant. It is synthesized in the upper layers of the sediments by aerobic and anaerobic degradation. Now it depends where all this is coming from. Some of the CIC can come from methane. And if it is indeed coming from methane, we should see it by light carbon isotopic signature. It can also come from buried organic matter in the sediments. Then it has a more moderate isotopic signature, around minus 25, but still lighter than marine carbonates. So in our survey, DIC concentrations in the sediments up to 50 millimolar and higher. The isotopic composition showed an interesting trend. We have the imprint of biogenic compounds and maybe some methane mixed in until temperatures of, let's say, 80 degrees Celsius. Because here we have the literature value for Grimer's vent DIC, the mixture of DIC that emerges from the Grimer subsurface. So we can say, based on this data set, that the microbial production of DIC from organic matter is active all the way up to approximately 80 degrees. 
And that seems to be the temperature limit for Weimar spaces. And somewhere in here is probably hiding the methane signal, but there's probably so much organic matter in there that we cannot really, we could not identify it and pull it out from the background. So we have initial geochemical indicators. Anaerobic oxidation of methane works at high temperatures, but it stops at approximately 75 degrees, or at least it is not isotopically expressed above 75 degrees. Okay, the next slide. Microbiology. What is the limit of microbial enrichment? Can you grow anaerobic methanotrophs in the lab and keep them happy at high temperatures? And our collaborators from the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Germany um, did that task. They are specialized in anaerobic microbiology. So they got Weimar samples and put them into a reaction chamber which could be heated up stepwise, and then they measured anaerobic oxidation of methane rate, micromole per day per gram biomass, at different temperatures. And you see how the rates with increasing temperatures are climbing. By the way, this zero to maybe 15 degrees is the temperature range that is normally measured in situ. Okay, but these Guaymas populations, they keep going and going and going and going up to 50, 60, 65 degrees. It seems to be no problem at all and only by maybe 70, 75 degrees they are having difficulties. And then anaerobic methane oxidation stops at around 75 or 80 degrees. Um, the stoichiometry of the reaction was checked here at 50 degrees. Here you see methane being consumed sulfide being enriched in almost precise one-to-one -one stoichiometry, showing that this is indeed sulfate-dependent sulfide producing anaerobic methane oxidation. So the microbiology works well up to 70, maybe 75 degrees. One more thing, we wanted to do molecular biology, the specialty of my lab. So we tried a gene sequencing survey for three different sampling sites where the anaerobic methane oxidation zone is either warm, well, moderately warm, 15 to 20 degrees, bathtub temperature, 30 to 35 degrees, or really hot, above 60 degrees. And that required searching for suitable sampling sites. Um, so in the end, we had a couple of good candidate sites. This is a white sulfur oxidizing mat where the temperatures were quite cool, 15 to 20 degrees, but still above background, which is 3 degrees. Then we had another location with microbial mass, um, warm temperatures, 30 to 35, and then finally a really hot site where two adjacent temperature measurements gave temperature readings of 65 to 96 degrees Celsius in the methane oxidation zone. So samples from all three sites were brought on the ship. Here we have the geochemical profiles. This is a cool site, this is a warm site, and this is the hot site. Here you see the um, isotopic composition of the methane <coughs> from the <coughs> subsurface towards the surface. <coughs> here you see the kick when it gets heavier, the imprint of anaerobic methane oxidation. And here you see the concentration going from high concentrations deep down four or five millimolar to lower concentrations, one, two millimolar. So we defined this as our best candidate for the anaerobic methane oxidation zone. For the warm AOM zone, the equivalent had higher temperatures up to 30 to 35 degrees. Here you see always the uh, matching temperature profiles. And here in the hot spot, this was really nice. Here we have the isotopic composition of the methane. It gets heavy all of a sudden at around 10, 8 centimeter depth from minus 35 to minus 15. And the concentration almost disappears from over 3 millimolar to below 1 millimolar. So this is a really hot active site. So we were very happy after finding this one. And most of the work subsequently focused on this site. Now we are, okay, and this is the comparable data set for DIC and sulfide, not so informative. Okay, and now, I have to explain this. Um, these are now phylogenetic trees, not based on fossils and systematic markers and morphology, but based on gene sequences. 
The tree is on its side, so the root is here. And when you work yourself through this labyrinth towards the tips, all these are modern organisms or the genes that organisms have. And when you look for related organisms, you simply look for leaves on one branch. Here is a, here is a branch with a cluster of related genes or organisms. Here is another one. And then they are sort of sister groups tied together at a higher level. And then you go down and find them. Okay, they are sister groups to another one. And here you find the common root of the whole cluster. And you go back and back and back and back to the deep root of this phylogenetic lineage. So it's essentially a phylogenetic tree of the kind that paleontologists are constructing. But since there is very few in terms of fossils or teeth or skeletons, one has to use gene sequences. Unfortunately, there are many which are highly informative, slowly evolving, so they cannot um, evolve in a crazy random fashion. One needs very slow molecular clocks, that is a technical term, in order to capture these deep um, evolutionary relationships. And what we have here are organisms um, which are either involved in methane production or methane oxidation. And in order to cut a very long story short, here is a special branch which consists exclusively of clones from Guaymas spaces. So nothing from other cold seeps and um, systems has been found here. And we find it mostly in hot sediments, in the hot sediment location where anaerobic methane oxidation is going at temperatures above 60 degrees. So I think this one is now our primary target. It's of course not in culture. Nobody has the organism in a petri dish or in a culture tube. So on um, future Grimas cruises, we want to do single cell genomics, wash single cells out of the sediment, and then separate them by flow cytometry. They pass a laser beam. Whenever a cell flows by, the DNA in this cell is um, fluorescing alerting the machine, a cell is coming, a cell is coming, and then the little drop of liquid where the cell is traveling is taken out into a sampling plate. And in this way you can sort cells after cells after cells like a bag of beans, only on a microscopic scale. And then individual scales can, individual cells can have their genome sequenced. In this way we can learn something about the um, metabolism and the genetic equipment of these mysterious organisms. This is a separate gene, so we try two different genes just to see whether we get the same result. And again, the same group appears, deep, uh, novel group within the overall phylogenetic structure of the methane oxidizing archaea. So it's very consistent. We have called this group the Anni-1 Guaymas lineage and hope to catch it the next time for genetic analysis. Okay, so far we have triple evidence for high temperature limits of anaerobic methane oxidation. Number one, the isotopic evidence. At approximately 70 to 75 degrees, we can no longer see the isotopic imprint of anaerobic methane oxidation. This is work that my graduate student Luke McKay is doing. He is writing up his thesis, hopefully right now. So he will have a lot to publish and to talk about. Number two, laboratory incubations done by our Max Planck collaborators show that a temperature range of 55 to 60 degrees seems to work nicely. The, in their enrichment, the methane oxidizing activities broke down at approximately 75 degrees. So it's similar. And number three, the genetic evidence. There is a novel group of methane oxidizers which occurs almost exclusively in the hot spots of Guaymas Basin. Um, temperatures about 60 degrees and which is our best candidate for the most temperature tolerant anaerobic methane oxidizer. Okay, we are going a bit further. We are of course interested in the subsurface of Grimer's Basin. All the, so all the sediment cores that I have been showing you are short, 30 to 50 centimeters like this. But Grimer's Basin has of course hundreds of meters of sediments interrupted by volcanic fills. And a lot is actually known about their chemistry. The uh, deep sea drilling project, leg number 64 in 1980, 1981, 
did a lot of chemistry, so there are good data for methane and alkanes throughout the sediments. And these concentration data allow to calculate theoretical energy yields, delta G, per mole electron, for the microbial oxidation of methane and higher alkanes. And it always turns out, with certain assumptions, you actually get energy, minus 5 to 10 kilojoule per electron. And for, in the case of methane, it depends. It's an 8 electron process multiplied by 8, which would be enough for microbial metabolism. And then one can recalculate this based on energy, um, the amount that is actually available to a microbial cell per cubic centimeters, and you also get a negative delta G, um, meaning cells have energy to spend if they oxidize methane and alkanes. So, Doug LaRoe, a thermodynamic um, theoretical microbiologist at the University of Southern California, is doing these calculations. And of course, it makes it very exciting now to look deeper into Grimer's basin and to check how far deep can methane oxidizing and other alkane oxidizing microbes actually be detected with molecular and microbiological tools. So it's one of the um, objectives in a Grimer's basin deep drilling proposal that some colleagues here at UNAM, myself, researchers in Botswana, have put in early this year in April for um, an attempt to do deep sea drilling in Grimer's Basin with improved geochemical and molecular microbiological tools. We hope for the best. Um, a quick preview before I close on future work. Um, this is uh, another thesis chapter of Luke McKay. He has looked now in one particular net system at a gradient, hot, less hot, cool, and checked the abundance of Grimas 1 archaea, the high temperature adapted organism. And in the center of the mat, in clone libraries, it increases in relative abundance with depth and temperature. In fact, here it's 83 degrees hot, so theoretically a little bit more than they can actually survive and other Grimers, uh, other unneeds, anaerobic methane oxidizers seem to decrease the steps. It's getting too hot for them. Then you move a little bit further away from the center, here. The temperatures are a little bit lower, so you have a depth of 62 degrees and mostly other methane oxidizers. Like we can no longer find only one Grimers. And at the control site, further away, Methane oxidizers are a minority, and the Grimers 1 group cannot be seen at all. So we again think this is really a specialist, and we want Grimers, which oxidizes methane in really hot hydrothermal sediments, and it is not seen anywhere else. The overall geochemical and maybe geological evidence or importance of all this is here we have now a temperature resistant methane safety valve. In this big cross-section of Grimer's Basin, drawn by my collaborators Adam Sewell and Daniel Zeraldi at the Woodsville Oceanographic Institution, they have tried to put everything into a big picture. Here is the spreading center. Here are the sediments. Here are the um, sills, with baked, indurated sediments around them, like little pancakes everywhere. And hydrothermal flux is circulating through the sediments and mobilizing buried organic carbon as CO2 and methane. The sediments are packed with organic matter. Now, of course, getting too much methane out can be dangerous. Methane is a highly effective greenhouse gas. Per molecule, it retains 20 times more heat than CO2. So methane pulses in the atmosphere have the potential of rapidly causing global warming of a much more serious kind than CO2. And methane is, in fact, suspected as the main culprit of the heating episode of the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum 55 million years ago, when oceans around the planet warmed up so much that even the deep sea increased from around freezing point today to 13 to 14 degrees Celsius, an enormous thermal shock. And that is blamed on methane. And the methane is supposed so is one scenario, to come from a similar geological scenario as Weimar's today. And 55 million years ago, that was the opening of the North Atlantic, when Norway and Greenland were spreading apart. 
and organic rich sediments in the North Atlantic got cooked by hydrothermal eruptions. You still see the basaltic fills today. So at some point, the entire North Atlantic must have been a gigantic Guaymas Basin. And methane must have been pouring out of it into the atmosphere. So, Adams and then favorite theory. Um, today, the only site where this scenario can be tested, where carbon fluxes and methane fluxes can be quantified, is in fact Guaymas Basin. And it is therefore important to know in Guaymas Basin the microbial and geochemical mechanisms that govern the flux of CO2 and methane. And with identifying the temperature limit of anaerobic methane oxidation, we actually know that it can be oxidized and trapped, returned to DIC and assimilated by microorganisms fairly deep in the subsurface as long as the temperature does not exceed 70 to 75 degrees Celsius. So there is a temperature resistant safety valve in the methane cycle, but of course it could be too much sometimes. Okay. At last, I would like to acknowledge some of my students and collaborators. Here is my former PhD student, Karen Noit. She is now an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, Long-term faculty member, Dan Albert. He is a genius with respect to building all kinds of deep sea landing equipment. Here we have a sulfate reducer lander. Uh, my former postdoc, Jennifer Biddle. Now on the faculty at the University of Delaware, Karen again. Uh, engineering genius Howard Mendelowitz, uh, working mostly with my colleague Chris Martins. He was lent out for this cruise also to work with the in situ instrumentation. Here Luke McKay, who is finishing his PhD and looking for a postdoc. Speaks Spanish fluently, hint, hint. <laughs> that of course knows molecular genetics and everything. Um, okay, Jennifer Biddle, oh, Barbara McGregor, my colleague. Um, here, she here she looks very, very severe. severe, for good reason. We appointed her the core dictator. Because at the end of a dive, samples are returned, and it just takes very long by democratic negotiation to divide them up. So Barbara simply said, okay, you get this, you get this, you get this. And we all obeyed, and then it was done in a very short time. And of course, in time to start working in the lab all night, all night, all night, until the next morning. Oh, I think here is Stephanie Meyer, a Max Planck graduate student now finished. She did a biogeographic structure of Guaymas Basin and found that the hydrothermal flux actually has a tendency of mixing many microbial populations. Um, it's like stirring the system all the time, and you need active hotspots like the uh, microbial maps with the um, high temperature undies to see biogeographical patterns. And finally, I hope that there is uh, some time for questions. Thank you all for coming at this hour. We haven't looked into toxic compounds, but we have looked into the environmental regime of these microbial maps. The yellow color, the yellow-orange color you refer to, is a particular octaheme cytochrome of sulfur oxidizing bacteria. So we have done the biochemistry. It's probably involved in nitrogen respiration of Bejiatora. So we have the protein sequence. It matches a gene, a suitable gene in the Bejiatora genome. So it's certainly made by Bejiatora and is a central protein in their metabolism. Um, why the um, numerous invertebrates do not get a foothold? I think it's because of the highly dynamic nature of these uh, microbial maps. The long-term temperature measurements have shown that the temperature changes all the time. In the upper 10, 20 centimeters, you have temperature spikes of 20, 30 degrees in short times. It is almost as if gigantic bubbles of hydrothermal fluid are coming to the surface, like bloop. They bathe everything for a short time in hot fluid. Then the bubble disappears. You wait again. The next bubble comes. And the um, orange mediator seem to be adapted to that. So they don't mind occasional temperature peaks. The white vegetables are more sensitive. But this could be one of the factors that limits invertebrate settlement in these microbial maps. You have to move a little bit away to a less dynamic regime, and then maybe it's more tolerable for larvae. But saying that, um, our um, collaborator on this course, uh, Javier Caraveo Patino, has actually found many small invertebrates, also in these vegetables maps, where they are feeding. So, so the Bejiatoa is, of course, a juicy um, 
meadow if you don't mind the taste of sulfur, because we are sulfur oxidizers, there's a lot of sulfur, but uh, many invertebrates don't mind, so there are all kinds of little amphipods and worms tunneling through these gigantic mats and eating the bacterial biomass. Uh, it's just not, it's just a little hard to understand are these sort of the nursery grounds, maybe like a salt marsh, like an estuary, or is this more a feeding ground for adult organisms that are already adapted to the um, difficult conditions in the mat habitat? That we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, there should be, because um, methanogens, for example, absolutely need nickel. Um, it's a central ion for um, key enzymes of the methanogenesis and methane oxidation pathway. Um, and um, so trace elements of nickel, trace amounts of nickel have to be there. Um, iron, of course, has to be there for iron sulfur reaction centers. But that is normally not a problem. In guimers, you have micromolar amounts. Um, we have, or more precisely, our geochemistry collaborators in Bremen have um, iron profiles for all kinds of um, um, alkali metals. Um, it's not exactly as rare earth metals or rare metals, but uh, there is a lot of detailed chemistry in Guaymas Basin, which has not really been done um, in sufficient detail yet. So I, I, my bet is there's a little bit of everything, but exactly how much, I don't know. My colleague Chris Marvels has worked on that extensively um, back in the 1980s, and he actually found that uh, when you go deep into the sediments, um, at when it gets hot enough, 60, 70, 80, 90 degrees, the concentration increases. So it's almost certainly uh, made from a thermal degradation of buried organic matter. And at the surface, the concentration generally decreases because it's consumed by microorganisms. So right at the sediment surface, you see only leftovers, maybe 100 micromolar, which is still enormous compared to other marine sediments. But when you go deep, it's uh, almost like vinegar. So, um, and the most likely, and we did some isotopic work. Um, the acetate has almost the same isotopic composition as buried organic matter, minus 25, delta C13. So it's almost certainly the same carbon. So I mean, this is a question for geologists. Was the Atlantic always ultra slow, or maybe was it a bit faster in the early years? So that I don't know. But, uh, I got introduced to this scenario actually earlier this year when we had a Grimers workshop in California and where the geologists were obsessed by this breakup theory. And I had never thought of it before, but it is obviously something that is now in the center of discussion. So I thought, okay, what is the evidence? And I mean, so far, the hard evidence, as far as I could understand from the geological sites, were similar sill formations in the North Atlantic uh, associated with the right age, 55 million years ago, of the kind that you see today in Guaymas Basin. So that is the hard evidence that actually exists. And now, of course, one has to build the scenario, the conjecture around it. Um, in many cases, yes. Um, you just need a sufficient flow of sulfide and DIC and methane. I mean, an ultra-slow ridge still has some hot spots where you have channelized hydrothermal flow and where the concentrations um, of um, inorganic electron uh, donors are high enough. So you have that in the Atlantic, um, or even the Gackle Ridge in the Arctic has now uh, chemosynthetic communities uh, photographed. So we do not have samples yet, but they certainly exist. Um, so even slow ridges still have the potential for chemosynthetic microbial communities. I mean, not as abundant as Guaymas Basin. It's really a special case. One that probably has to search. And in Guaymas Basin, one does not have to search. You dive and you see immediately. The largest uh, chimney, it's called Rebecca's Roost, and it's 20 meters high, uh, built up of mostly metal sulfides. Um, I mean, these metal sulfides are very friable. So when the chimney grows too large, um, it will collapse. I mean, so far, Rebecca's roost has been stable. Um, from time to time, it's being revisited. And it has been there at least for 20, 30 years. So we have to keep our fingers crossed. It's actually amazing. One should not touch it. It has um, several outflows, at, um, in particular at the tip, 
Uh, the hydrothermal fluid is creating a kind of fan that grows like a mushroom at the side of the chimney, a huge flange. And the shimmering water is flowing against the underside of this mushroom of pancake and creates a shimmering surface. So when you're in the right spot in the submersible and you look up, like here at the ceiling, you see a shimmering surface, a mirror like silver of hydrothermal water moving underneath this flange and then rising up into the water column. So of course one cannot touch these things. They look just amazing. And they grow and collapse naturally. At some point the flange will collapse under its own weight and another flange might grow at the same spot or somewhere else. Yeah, but uh, it's interesting, these are the exceptions. Mostly you see wide uh, expanses of mud and low hydrothermal mounds, probably carbonate or sulfide. Um, but uh, it looks very different from a classical hydrothermal vent site where you have all these black chimneys and black basalt and obsidian.